I'd first, Tracy, like to introduce you to everybody here. Everybody you see in the Zoom session has been invited because they are our top volunteers, our top leaders, their affiliate leaders, learning network leaders, and they are part of who we really are as our hashtag, we are Q. You, um, these are our friends. You, and there are folks in here that I have known for many years, that I have taught with, that I have um, got to be an administrator with. And the level of knowledge and expertise and ed tech leadership specifically that's in this room right now is top notch. Like I take anybody in any other state and say, I'll put my people up against yours. <laughs> so I'd like to just start by Introducing you a little bit, and uh, they're going to do a casual introduction of how I know who you are, how that ha came about, and then who you are a little bit more formally, but with some of the fun that comes from the fact that you are from Berkeley originally. Okay. So for everybody that is joining us this evening, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Tracy Tokuhama Espinosa last year as I was visiting my good friend and Fulbright teacher, John Miller. You'll notice that John is in this session as well, and he is a longtime Q member who has done extraordinary work. And as you see some of those hands moving, that's because we also have a real heart for our deaf and hard of hearing community. And this is how we show our gratitude, our thanks, and our joy. And there's a real shout out to John for his leadership because it's through him that I got to meet Tracy last year at the World EduLead Conference. As Tracy spoke about neuromyths and what practices we continue to implement in the classroom despite the fact that they are myths and not factually based methods by which we should be teaching, it really struck a chord with me. We talk about who's a kinesthetic learner, an audio learner, a visual learner, and we all have done this in our classrooms. I've done this myself as a teacher where I've separated everybody out, right? Go, you know, you're here, you're here, and we teach kids that this is the way they learn best. And Tracy understands and has been part of the research in the background that says, well, this just isn't really true. That was a deep connection. Tracy's work is much deeper than that. She has been teaching remotely and online for, Tracy, how many years? I used to be the head of online education here in Ecuador about 10 years ago when they were trying to get off the ground. Uh, but in the course in Harvard for the past five years, so since they began to put courses in their <laughs> extension school, about five years. So Tracy will not only be able to model for us what effective online and remote learning looks like, but she also has the science behind it. And there are things that she's going to let us know work really well, and this is why we should be doing them. And then there are also some things that we believe in and that we love that she will distill those myths yeah. for us. Um, so hopefully you've had a chance to either read the blog, listen to the podcast, and get some of that background information. What else is important to know about Tracy is that she is a California native. She is one of us in terms of educational technology and leadership and learning. She's also one of us in terms of being from California and as she describes herself, a bit of a love child as her parents met each other their freshman year in Berkeley and had her at a very young age. Um, Tracy's had this extraordinary life where she has been able to travel a lot and met her husband while she was at Boston University. Um, he is an Ecuadorian diplomat who's taken her down to Ecuador and now she has the opportunity to teach globally online, which is very valuable to us because as a global community, we are now shifting to online and remote learning. And thank you, Tracy, for joining us, for leading us in this interactive conversation and session and bringing this to our We Are Q community and everyone else who joins us in this learning. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. It's really very exciting to be here. I wanted to tell you or, or suggest to anybody that feels that there's an extra support by having a transcription um, done immediately, you can just tap into another um, uh, 
another uh, page here, otter, O-T-T-E-R dot A-I. And to set up an account is quick and fast and free, um, but you're able to then um, see all of the work transcribed and hear my dogs at the same time. It's, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, let me and just like shut this real door. About online I'm going to shut learning. this because <laughs> this, is, this is the real thing. Hang on just a second. All right, while Tracy does that, this is so for all of you that are here tonight, you, I started working with Q almost a year ago, right, and going to this remote work environment. And it is inevitable that as you jump into a meeting, like somebody will knock on the door, somebody will be blowing leaves outside, and your dog starts barking. And it just is what real is real. And then there's somebody that like will break that whole like six feet dis <laughs> social distancing thing. <laughs> Oh, Tracy. Oh, I totally Thanks. forgot. I totally missed that with the coffee. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Pam, for that wonderful introduction. And I am going to be taking this otter.ai off so that we can see the slides because we all have kind of limited screens. But for those of you who feel comfortable and think this is a great addition, which it definitely is, it's wonderful for um, anybody uh, who just wants an additional support, the more uh, ways that we can see here uh, what we're doing, um, the better. And so in this sense, um, people who might be second language learners or people who might um, have hearing problems, this is a great support. Um, but for this moment right now, what I'm going to suggest you do is to put that into your screen on the side as a sidebar. And then also you can drag the people off and then you can arrange the people like you want. And then please leave space so that you can also see now the slide deck here, okay? Are we all good to go? Does anybody have questions about that? Because it's a kind of like several things at the same time, but uh, I've been told you're a very savvy crowd. So this is something we can pick up pretty quickly, okay? So just as a quick um, check, all of you made it in, so I don't think you have any problems with Zoom updates, but um, because Zoom is really being overwhelmed these days, there are a whole lot more updates that are happening more frequently, and uh, especially with all the free versions for schools, um, they're doing updates like crazy. So do make sure, if you just look up at the top left of your screen, you'll see that there's a zoom.us, and if you click that, you'll see that there's something for updates. So make sure that um, check for updates every time you come in, because it may change the sound or um, pictures or things that you can do uh, when you're in Zoom, okay? Also, um, right now, I think every one of you is muted except for Amy, and that's okay because she has a nice quiet home. But if any of you do or you know, got your kids running around in the background, you might want to mute yourself and just unmute as you're talking. That would probably be best for everybody, right? And if anybody is still not showing us their face, Omar, it would be so great if you would turn your cameras on because, uh, Heidi, it's really, really good to be able to see people's faces. Um, and I'll explain that later uh, when, it, when it comes down to... Um, uh, social contagion and uh, understanding neuroscience a little bit better. There's a lot of things that we get from facial cues and really important that we're able to see each other. So um, Tao and Jennifer, if you do have um, cameras, and it'd be great if you would turn those on, okay? And if anybody does need to change their names, please go ahead and do that. I will be calling you whatever you've put up there. So make sure that you're happy with that. Uh, ben Kinder... Rock, I can't say, but anyways, Ben Kinder will Rock, be calling it's you. Captain, the captain of the it's, it's a very long one there. That's why we don't see it. Yeah. Okay, you got it. Um, so that would just be sort of the update here. The other non-essential things, if you don't, if you, I'm sorry, the other non-essential windows that you might have open on your computer, if you have limited bandwidth, and we all do these days because everybody's online, go ahead and shut any programs you're not using because that will also conserve the bandwidth and that, um, believe it or not, Zoom is fantastic because it isolates the problem. So if you've got lousy internet, Bert, you're going to feel it. And we will hear you speak strangely, but it's not going to affect the rest of us. So what's so interesting about the whole program is that before on other programs, um, if anybody had a problem, we'd all feel it. Um, now it's isolated to the user. So uh, just try to sh shut all your windows if possible. Okay. And if you do have um, headphones or earbuds, that would just sort of cancel out some of the other sounds that we might be hearing. So thanks for doing that. It, does anybody... Um, how many of you have never used Zoom before? Have you all used Zoom before? You all are very comfortable in Zoom? Seems like it, so-so, more or less. So far, so good. Are you liking it or are you still trying to figure it out? Just sort of understanding it. It's been pretty good so far, hasn't it? I have to tell you, they're an incredibly responsive group. Um, 
Pam mentioned that uh, five years ago, um, Harvard asked if we would put our course 100% online, mainly because of the demand, the students wanted it. It was kind of crazy. We'd have students who lived a block away and they would still prefer to do the online option than to walk a block in the snow or to find a parking place or whatever. And so they said, can't you guys just put this class 100% online? And when we did that, they promised to partner with us really tightly. So we are on Canvas and at the very end, I'm going to show you um, some options. If any of you wanted a tour of, of my classroom in, in Canvas, I'm happy to show you the way we set things up. Um, but it's uh, been a very well-rewarded instructional design. We got a five over five from the, from the students last year, which is pretty amazing. They thought the design was, was spot on for separating and repeating activities enough and having enough reinforcement that they were all able to feel that they'd learned quite a lot. Um, and many of them mentioned to us, it's like having three levels of classes. I think I, I worked a whole lot, but I learned about three times as much as I do in other classes. And so we feel the design is very good in case people wanna look at that later. Okay, all right, so with that, I'm going to move on to the beginning. Are we okay, Pam, or did you want to say anything else or do any other checks for technology? Cynthia, is anybody on the chat saying any, pro any, there any problems we need to attend to before we move on? Good to go? Okay, great. Lisa, do you want to say anything to us? Leslie, Omar, does anybody have any thoughts, concerns, worries so far? No? Good to go? Okay. I'm just going to ask you to do one thing more now in the chat. Um, we are in some kind of crazy times, and I know many of you have been talking it up and thinking about going online maybe for years, and all of a sudden you are thrust into a situation where maybe some of you have prepared more than others, um, but these are really uncertain times. And so could I just have you quickly type at least one idea, what is something you need? Uh, need from us, need from your organization? What do you need to be able to manage this kind of, these times, the way things are going? Do you need, uh, better communication channels? Do you, need, um, do you need more people to change their attitude about being online? Do you need, what are things that you think you need? Do you need more money because you don't have enough, your kids don't have devices on which to learn or I don't know what you need. I, I'd like to put my finger on the pulse of what you guys are feeling right now to be able to make sure we address that as we talk today. So some questions have to do with flexibility and does that have to do with flexibility in your time or does it have to do with the curriculum or could you be a little more specific, Ben? Could you just type that in there? That'd be really helpful. Um, internet access. Michael, I want to give you, um, have you ever heard of something called Rachel? Rachel is a really cool uh, thing. Uh, have I you heard of that? I, no, I haven't. Okay. This is awesome. Uh, so Rachel is amazing. Rachel is a remote access um, something, something, something. Um, I'll have Cynthia put a hyperlink in there. But um, Rachel uh, is actually a disc. It looks like a pie disc, a, a piece of pie. I mean, a, um, a pie pan. But it actually projects out internet um, up to 150 yards, up to 50 devices. And it costs $400. And I work with people who are doing those, using that in Africa and in Myanmar and other parts, but it actually creates, there's no problem with internet. The whole community can have the internet uh, if you place it right. So, uh, and you can buy it online really easily. So that's a, another thing. So having internet or having devices is important. Connections with others, Lisa, that's a huge thing right now. Um, and one of the things we wanna talk about today about being online in these settings even if we have to be socially you know, distant in that sense, it's only physical because the contact you can have, um, one of the things we really love about this online setting is that um, we can actually be together and not necessarily be together, but at the same time, uh, it's even more powerful than being in a classroom setting. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. And I want you to give me some hypothesis about why you think social contagion, people being able to infect each other's mood um, is stronger in online context than it is face-to-face, -face, believe it or not. We're going to talk about that a little bit as well. Curation, there's so many resources. Excellent, Susan. Um, both uh, Cynthia and I and one other colleague of ours, we just did a huge global audit for um, an international study that was for Latin America, but our part was to do the global audit of how are teachers using um, technology. Are they using them for platforms to learn things? Are they using them to download videos? Are they using them for apps? What are they using it for? 
And we ended up doing this huge Excel of more than 400 different ways that teachers are using uh, devices. And they fell into four primary categories. Um, some things were to support student, um, students' needs, like helping fill in gaps with certain mathematical skills, right? Other things had to do with um, institutional and more managerial things. How do I organize my class better and have students all communicating as well as parents and all the rest of that? So how do I organize them? Other things had to do with teacher education. So teachers learning a lot more about their own practice and pedagogy as they uh, worked online. Uh, and then the third thing had to do with global um, platforms that are now used to feed in or complement other things that we already do, like things like Khan Academy and stuff like that, that have videos that we can integrate into our class, whether it's online or face-to-face. -face. So if you're uh, interested in seeing that list, we're happy to share the resources that are available, right? Um, Jalene, believe it or not, most of the world is going online now and they're going online in their phones. It's, it's a luxury to have a computer, it really is. Now, some, some school districts can do this, but working in Latin America, I have to tell you, the only way people are getting online is through their phones. And so it is not ideal, but most programs, even Zoom and Canvas and all the rest of it, are now, they have the two different formats. So when you download the app for a telephone, you're gonna see it differently. But the goal is that people could use their phones if necessary, because it's almost, in many places in, in the world, it's one of the only ways people can do it because it's just too expensive for everybody to have a nice big computer. Um, but other schools have found other ways of doing that where the kids actually use the school computers, which is not gonna happen right now, but there's other options on that as well. Um, online computers, free online science. Um, there is a, Melissa, I don't know if you are. Melissa, where are you? Are you a science teacher? I am. What do you teach? I teach high school biology, but I know okay. all the teachers of all the disciplines are looking for replacements since we're unable to do them online with our, or in class with our students. Yes, you are. Okay, I want you to see something that is the coolest ever. Uh, last year in San Francisco, um, I went to the Reimagine Education Conference, and the thing that won the first prize is called Labster, labster.org. If you go to Labster, it's basically a million-dollar laboratory in every person's pocket or whatever it is, basically, because it allows you to do science experiments in sort of this virtual reality setting. Um, and it allows you to do things like make mistakes in a lab and blow up and not really blow up, right? So it, it lets you handle, you know, toxic waste and all kinds of crazy stuff. It's amazing. You can go under underwater. You can do all kinds of cool stuff. But have a look. There are ways to do this these days, which is really fascinating. Virtual reality and augmented reality are changing a lot of the experiences. For example, go on a field trip. Obviously, you're not going to be able to, you know, go to Galapagos and, and, and see the iguanas, you know, right now, but you could go on a virtual field trip and there's tons of ways to see that and actually experience and believe it or not, in the wild, somebody will say, oh, look over there, that was that really unique little frog that's the size of your thumbnail. Well, that's cool, but actually it's even better when you can see it in the program when it's really right close up and you can actually look at the details of it. So there are programs that are doing science labs online um, that you should really look at and I'm happy to explore that with you later. Katie, you. I don't understand what you mean about boundaries. What are boundaries? Do you mean like physical boundaries or mental boundaries or well, Katie? Can you help me understand that word a bit? Sorry, more? we had a still here. So my biggest problem is boundaries with shutting it down as far as stopping with helping everyone, all the questions that keep coming in, because I don't know, they think eight o'clock, I'm still on for them. And right now I do want to help them, but my family and myself also needs to matter. Perfect example of why we have to, when you're going to go online with your students, one of the best models I've seen uh, is one that um, Cynthia and I worked with, with uh, the American school here, which they've implemented and said it's perfect because they actually had a beautiful study because they implemented one format with the high school and another with primary. And it you know, was so successful in the high school and terrible in the primary that they're all gonna go to the high school format, which was what? That your day is identical. Whatever you were gonna do at 7.35 on Tuesday is what you do. And so basically the kids just know that. It's just that we're online together, right? So 
if you're supposed to be in English at that time, that's where you are. And so you're on your, in your English class and you have the English class and the lesson, all the rest of it. And then it's time for, you know, going to math. And then we have a break. Oh, we have recess. Okay. And the teacher reminds them, okay, go and do some jumping jacks, run around the house, kids. Okay. And then come back. Um, and then when it's time, they begin history and they begin whatever. But basically, um, they found that when they made it loose and free in primary, uh, it was a total mess. And teachers were answering emails until midnight because uh, every nothing was organized. And the teachers, they all said, do this and then get back to me. And the students would write, you know, at eight o'clock when they were just starting to do stuff because they didn't pay attention to it all day long. And this teacher is dragged out all day long. It was terrible. So now they're all going to go to having the set schedule. So maybe that's another way to do that. You can also set up within your online platform. I don't know what you're using right now. Are you using like, you know, Google Hangouts or are you using, what are you using? Are you using Canvas or Moodle or what's your, where are you meeting students? I'm using a tons of different things, but I have my high school students in Google Classroom. I have my university students in Moodle, and then I have my government all over the place because they're all over the place. So th that's probably my bigger juggle is because I'm already doing- I was gonna say, <laughs> I, don't think that, <laughs> I think that might have to do with part of that is sort of streamlining those things might not happen for a long time because it's kind of like, do you guys remember, um, David, do you remember when we had like um, beta? And VHS, there was the beta VHS wars or whatever it was. Well, this is kind of where you're at right now in the in the young, you know, way that platforms are developing. A few will begin to bubble to the top as being really superior, but at right now everybody's trying one of everything. And it's kind of a mess. And so you have to be patient with that. That's a that's a big deal there, right? Um, Martin, I think it's the same idea of Katie's problem of having multiple platforms is also this idea of having multiple gadgets. Everybody wants to try this app or that app or this other thing. Is is that what you're you're getting at with that comment, Martin? Unfortunately, no. Um, we uh, our district is set up for um, having gadgets, one on one gadgets, or actually more than one on one gadgets for all of our students, but not to take home. So we're now going over that. Um, we're, we're now jumping that hurdle. And um, uh, at the moment, um, we're sending um, staff home who are non-essential, uh, which leaves just myself and my IT manager. So we're, we're needing to bring our team back. Um, not only that, but um, when, when you have a team of, 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 of six for a deployment of 9,500 Chromebooks, and um, we're also training, uh, today was my kickoff, so I just finished training and you know, still working with vendors and everyone else. So the, the whole deployment process is not just like, oh, let's grab a gadget and let's give it over to, you know, to the parents. Um, I have parents who are not home and giving me a call and say, hey, can you email me? They said the word email me, the Chromebook to where I'm located. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's having, a, um, you know, a, a culture shift that you have to move forward and you're, you're juggling all, all these different acts. And, um, you know, for those of us, and I'm just looking at the screen here, every single one of us here has, I, I, I you know, I tell myself, I go, oh, this is what we've been preparing for, you know, for the past, you know, 10, 20 years, all the ed chats, all the Q conferences, all, you know, the stuff that we've done. Um, now, now, now we're being called upon and every skill set that you have, it's now going to be put to the test. Um, but a huge part is just, you know, not enough manpower to, and, and at the same time is understanding is let's take care of our kids and our staff first. Yes, this will happen, but it's not going to happen at, at, at you know, no one's going to have their Chromebooks by Monday, <laughs> right? That's not going to happen. They, they will come, you know, they will be able to take home. They will have filters and all that wonderful stuff, but, um, you know, people are not understanding how large this type of deployment is. If you've ever been in a school district and if you ever had a, um, a curriculum, you know, implementation, you know how much people that takes and how much uh, uh, manpower that takes. Well, this is, you know, exactly the same. But then not only that, you know, I, I told my team, I'm like, well, you know, as and I'm looking here as well, you know, well, it's great that you're all at home, but more than likely, I'm going to stay here until the wheels fall off. <laughs> yeah, right. um, I know somebody just like you in exactly your job in Missouri, and he'd love to talk to you. And I think that 
um, when somebody else mentioned being with other people, um, commiseration is a wonderful thing, but also solutions can come out of some of those talks. So maybe um, he's had an idea that you might like and vice versa. So I'd highly encourage those kind of networks to, to really um, take off. Okay, so what we want to do in the next uh, half hour is uh, talk about this big idea of moving, um, and I forgot to say, anything that was in the chat, we will definitely respond to in detail if we haven't or don't do it in the talk right now. We'll definitely get back to you with the answers, okay, and there's going to be a Google Drive that has um, the presentations, but they're also in your chat right now. You can download the presentations. There's the short one we're going to see right now, and then there's the long one that I really hope you get the chance to look at because there's a lot more detail in there, okay? But also, um, I'll be mentioning something about bundles or mini libraries of information, um, and those will also be in the Google Drive. So you'll have access to all of that, so don't worry. And I saw somebody taking a picture. Take all the pictures you like, but you don't have to because they're all right here. And this recording will also be uploaded. Um, within the next 12 hours and you can have everything that we're seeing right now you'll see all over again but you get to see yourself and you get to see mm, what was I looking like when I when they she said that <laughs> like Jolene is like that was cool news right and she's happy about it but then somebody else is like oh what am I supposed to do with that information okay so you get a chance to see yourself all over again too okay so what we want to I want to begin uh, even though we've been going for a while here with a kind of an invitation, and this has a little bit to do with your brain. I want you to write down this website. Um, we run a website called thelearningsciences.com and everything we do in our classes is flipped. That means we make videos all the time for everything. Videos on memory and on detention and executive functions and on emotion and learning and everything. And they're all up there. We, we flip our classroom and we just provide everything for free there. So you can just look at uh, thelearningsciences.com and also my email. Because if you guys are brave enough to do this, um, you shouldn't do it alone. I know you guys have wonderful support system, but maybe you want a resource or you hear about, um, you want to double check if this app is really legit or not. Um, I'm happy to give you my opinion. I don't know that I'll always have the answers. And if I don't, I won't lie to you. I will just point you in the right direction, though, to somebody who might. Um, have better information, but we have access to quite a lot of good information. But let me ask you something, uh, Amy. Do you know why I'm asking you to write this? What do you know? Do you know anything about the brain, and do you know why I would ask you to write something? Yes, because I will process it deeper and better. I already have a list of the things that you've talked about already. I will go back to them. Um, I will explore them. Um, but so you can go them back down, to them, which means. You're going to be able to go back, which means you can do what? What system in your brain is being uh, triggered with this? Activated. Um, I don't, you know, for me, just personally, um, this is the um, this is the way I note it, remember it, process Aha. it. Bingo. So, Bingo. So here, here's a huge idea. Write this down. There and it's is not, no learning. And it's, yeah, it's not just because I'm the oldest person on the screen, but it's, <laughs> no. it's because... It's because that that help that does help me to process it absolutely. So go ahead. And you have and you have nailed it. You've nailed it because Veronica, did you know that there is no learning without well functioning memory systems and well functioning attention systems? Memory and attention are vital pillars for learning. Without memory or without attention, you do not have okay. learning. So one of the things that writing does is it extends our memory, just as Amy has shared with us, right? She's able to go back and see it again. Even if you just jot down a word or two here or there, you'll remember better. And this is a big problem we have, Heidi, because most of us know that taking notes is a brilliant idea. But did you know that almost no teacher really ever teaches their kids how to teach notes? They just presume that the teacher the year before did it. But Nobody, people are not explicitly teaching kids how to take notes, and therefore they don't know what's the important information. They're not learning that. So try to take good notes, um, because I'm also going to ask you for two other reasons. I want you to take notes because at the very last minute, I'm going to ask you to fill out this. I want to ask you if you, if there were three things that we said today that you didn't know before, because you are a very savvy group, and it's going to be hard to impress you, but I want to see if there's three things you didn't know beforehand. If there are two things that you're finding this is cool. This is pretty interesting. I'm going to look into this a little bit more. And maybe even one thing, Terry, you'd say, okay, I'm going to change. I'm going to do this differently. 
I'd like to see if you can do this three, two, one at the end of the presentation today. That's going to be your goal. So that's also why you got to write stuff down, okay, so that you can remember to know what things. And my students, since we do this for every live encounter, they begin to take their notes differently. Like they'll underline, oh, this is new, or they put a star next to something that they want, they think is interesting, they have to follow up on, or they circle the thing they're going to change. They know that this is coming, so they take their notes differently because they know that these are, this is going to be asked of them, okay? So I'm going to give you a heads up for that. That's one reason. But the other reason I'm asking you to write down my email is because there is no cognition without emotion. Everything you learn is charged with an emotional experience. And that's just because of the physiology of the brain. You receive information. Uh, the very first hubs your, the signal is going to stop in is to double check with memory systems because your brain is smart. It says, Martin, man, I, if I don't have to learn something totally new, if I can relate it to something I already know, all the better because it saves energy. So the first thing your brain does is check with memory systems. But literally, it's amygdala front lobe back to the hippocampus but within a split second. It happens very, very quickly. But your brain cannot review memory uh, emotions for, uh, without having cognition. You have to have an emotional state. The big deal though, Holly, is emotions are not the same as feelings. Emotions are generated by the body, right? And they're chemicals. But the feeling is the psychological decision, how are you gonna feel about it? So right now, Omar, you might be saying, I am in emotional distress. I don't wanna be inside the house. I'm being asked to do something I don't wanna do. And your stomach is going like this. But psychologically, you can decide to feel challenged. This is cool, okay? You're gonna still have that gunk in your stomach because the chemicals are already there, but you can decide how you feel. And that's a really powerful thing for us to, as teachers to learn, but also for students. We know that all decisions are influenced by emotions and that we know that you make decisions faster when you're afraid. So if somebody threatens you or something like that, okay, let's just do, let's just do that. Because you don't, you're afraid, you make quick decisions. This also explains the 2016 election. Fear is a much quicker decision maker than empathy. It's a very powerful thing to think about in your brain. So the reason I am asking you to write down my email is you guys are not alone. You have each other. And if you have a technical question, you have me. I mean, I love my topic and what we do. And if there's anything we can do to support you to feel more comfortable here, just let us know. Okay, so write that down. So what we're going to try to do is just four things. I'm going to ask you, as we've already begun to do, is think a little bit about how our role is changing right now and drastically. I want you to consider this new profile, what, it, what we're asking of teachers, which is different. And I'm going to show you through Mind, Brain, Health, and Education a few ideas that we're going to directly relate to technology, okay? And we're going to look at some old tools, but I want to look at this and interpret this a little bit differently through a Mind, Brain, Health, and Education lens, a different way of understanding the information through other learning sciences, okay? So in 2017, I had the great honor to be on an OECD uh, expert panel. The OECD countries are the richest countries in the world, including the United States, right? And they make policy recommendations. And one of the things they recommended is that teachers have to change. The format of teachers has to change. And basically, in the thing that we looked at, um, the bottom line is that there's two things missing from teacher education. Teachers do not receive enough information. Okay, one begins with an N and one begins with a T. John, what do you think the answer is? If you think that teachers aren't getting enough of two big things in when they become teachers, when they're trained, what do you think the, the T stands for or the N? Does anybody have any ideas? John, do you have any idea that the T is something we've already been talking about a little bit? <laughs> and the N has to do with the T, anybody what we're talking about. Any ideas about what it is? Holly, you nailed it. Neuroscience. Teachers are not learning enough about their brain and technology. Boom, you got it. So neuroscience and technology are things that are really missing from teacher education programs right now. And there is a group, if you guys get the chance to look at them, uh, Deans for Impact, which is a group of university deans of colleges of education that are now decided to embrace this. They are teaching much more neuroscience and more technology. That's the way they're starting it. But that doesn't help the teachers who are in practice now, like you. So we have to do these kinds of trainings to sort of get everybody else up to speed. So what is it that we are now seeing as a new model? Everybody knows you shouldn't let people teach if they don't know their topic. Does that make sense, Bert? Like if you don't know math, don't teach math, right? Okay, so you have to have content knowledge, right? And then the old model just said, this is it. If you have content 
and you have pedagogical knowledge. If you know how to teach, if you know strategies and activities, then you're cool, right? That's, this was Shulman's model since the 80s. This is how we thought teachers were trained, right? Now we've added on these two other elements. Now we say, no, no, it's not just enough to, be, to know teachers' content pedagogical knowledge, like to know knowledge of how to teach math, but you also have to understand what technological tools you can leverage to help you do that. And that means what is so cool about this idea is that, um, Terry, it means that you use technology to give yourself more time to do the human part of teaching. Let Grammarly fix the grammar problems. So I don't have to worry about comma splices so I can talk to that kid about the way he's thinking about this. Let Canvas or Moodle automatically correct your quiz. So then, Michael, you can go back and tell the kid, well, it looks like you got number three wrong. Why do you think you got it wrong? Let me talk that through because the machine will tell you what went wrong. They won't tell you why it went wrong, but the teacher can. So the idea is how do we leverage technology to give us more time to do that human element of teaching? The technology will tell you, you know, you got 100% on this, but they're not gonna be able, Lisa, to motivate you like a person can. So there's things that machines do well and we should let them do it. And there's things that people do well and we should let them do it. But most teachers don't know about the ways to leverage technology. And the last piece, believe it or not, is most teachers are not fully aware of the brain. <laughs> they don't know how the brain really does work, which is kind of crazy, Valerie. I mean, you'd think that, you know, it's the organ of your existence is the brain. Um, and we change them every day, but we know very little about how that works. So the idea here is that we put all this in the context, the cultural context that we live in, the value systems we have within our societies, and then we get something that turns the teacher or the educator into someone who looks more like a learning scientist. We're gonna be using this information to learn like learning scientists, nurture ourselves from other sciences. Mm -hmm. And this turns into what was my doctoral thesis was called the science and the art of teaching. So basically, Teaching is an art, you know, putting the finger on the pulse of that whole group and making it all move along is amazing. And it's something you cannot break down into little scientific, you know, parts, you know, do A and B occurs. But you can nurture yourself with this information from science that can make us all better teachers. So when we looked at what does that actually mean within the context of mind brain education, the first thing we got to do is just Five basic steps. The first is we got to get rid of the junk. <laughs> Stephen, it is incredible that people still think that some people are right-brained or left-brained. It's an amazing that you think that there's such a thing as learning styles. Are you kidding me? That you, you prize one modality over another? That people use 10% of their brains? Those things have to be cleaned up and gone. Once we clear the stage then, then we can talk about things that are called principles. And these are things that are true, Holly, for all human brains, it doesn't matter how old or young you are or what culture you're in, it's true for all human brains. And we're gonna show you those in just a second. Um, and then we talk about tenants. Tenants are things that are also true. There's only 21 of them, true, but they vary greatly. So for example, James, do you think that motivation is important for learning? James, do you think motivation is important for learning? Yeah? Obviously, motivation is totally important for learning. The problem is what motivates you does not motivate John. And what motivates Martin doesn't motivate Holly. So it's really silly when people say, oh, well, let's do a motivational activity. What does that mean? For who? So it all depends on the individual. So this means that these things are very important and true, but they have a huge range of human variation, okay? Then we have to take into consideration information about the context. And that has a lot to do, there's a very cool subfield, it's called um, cultural neuroscience, in which we look at um, how artifacts like number systems literally change different neural networks in the brain, right? So there is a difference there. And then after that, then maybe we could talk about suggestions of what to teach, okay? So when we talk about things like the principles, we really only have six things that are out there. And believe it or not, um, John, this was gonna be my original talk and we don't, we're not gonna do it. So you've got all the slides and all of the video of this talk about the principles and tenants in mind-brain education are on the Learning Sciences website. You guys can all watch that later, okay? But there are some basic ideas, not rocket science, but these are the only things that 112 um, uh, educational neuroscientists, mind-brain education uh, and neuroscientists around the world could agree on. That's the only thing they could say is really true for all human brains. But then we also asked them about tenants. 
and they were only 21 things they said is true for all. Yes, motivation is important. Yes, stress, anxiety, depression, influence learning. Yes, attention influences learning. Yes, feedback is important and nutrition. However, it's different for every person. That's the big kicker here. So you can't say, let me teach you about motivation and learning because it's different. Depending on your prior experiences, David, I will react differently and be motivated by different things, right? So be careful about those things. But all of these are explained on the other video, okay? So if we look at this context, that was mind brain education. What I wanna look at right now then is to switch to this technology. Oh, somebody sent me this. Did you guys get this one? This was so funny. So if you're doing technology, if you're trying to integrate these things, what are some things that, are, that work? What I'm going to do now is to show you how breakout rooms work in Zoom. You are gonna be put into a room with two other people, more or less, okay? And in that room, you're only asked one question. What are the tools? Remember, we were talking about this. What can you use to leverage technology to give you more time to do the real teaching? What are some of the tools that you already know of that you can use either on a platform or either on a, um, or with apps or something like that, okay? So I want you to now, you're gonna have to do something. When I create the room, you're gonna have to accept it, okay? And I've got a timer and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring you back from the room in four minutes, okay? That means you have a very short amount of time to say, oh, Valerie, good to see you again. Yeah, Antonio, nice to see you too. Okay, no chit chat. Then you're gonna say, okay, what was the question? The question was, what are some tools? And I want each group to be able to come back with perhaps five different things that you guys already know and use that can help facilitate online learning, okay? Does that make sense? Antonio, what are you supposed to do? Can you open your mic and say it clearer than I did, please? What are, what is yeah. your what are you supposed to do right now? We have to sh we have to share at least five tools that we've been using or know how to use uh, for distance learning. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so please accept your room, and I'll bring you back in four minutes. Join, join, join. You have to. Well, we actually, we're just getting on, making sure we can hear each other. Um, I'm Omar, so you're Susan, and um, I know you're Pam. Hey there. So um, I know a tool that we're using is Zoom. Um, we're using that a lot, but I'm finding a lot of my students really aren't familiar with Zoom, and they've been more comfortable using Google Hangouts. So that's been something I've found as an interesting. We've been using Google Hangouts with our students, and um, this week our tech opened up for us Google Meet. So we can start using Google Meet. Oh, wow. Oh, oh wow. So. That makes a difference. And there are so many platforms out there. And even, you know, once we get connected, it's what do we do with it next? Right. Absolutely. Right, right. Um, one thing that, one tool that I'm using um, is, it's a, an easy communication tool is I'm using um, S'more to create newsletters and put all the links in so I can push it out to all the families. And um, I can embed videos that I'm creating in YouTube just to connect with kids too. Very nice. Omar, I know one thing that I've recently, I've recently began to use with my students is easy texting. Easy texting is actually a website where you can upload all the phone numbers and send out blast texts to your students. Now the cool thing is right now during the crisis, they do have a free option but I definitely know it was something very much worth paying for because it allows you to get all of your messages out. It's nothing anyone has to approve or sign up to like remind. It comes from like 474747, but they get the information right away. So just like you're sharing with the s'more, what we'll do is we'll send out a link within the text message. That way they can just click on that. They can have access to the newsletter, to, which has in, embedded videos and other links and things like that. So it's kind of like bringing them both together. Yeah, we're doing that with our student information system. We're putting the link into mm -hmm. that and then pushing it out through our student information system and then also putting it out to student emails. Wow. Now, I do know that recently um, when I was having a difficulty getting the s'more, not the s'more, I'm sorry, the um, easy text set up because of the PO um, timeline shortage, I ended up using a Google Voice account. What I did was I created a Google Voice for the program using a Google account. 
and you can send out up to 10 text messages at a time. And the cool thing is I sent out like 60 messages and like six, you know, different texts and it went really cool. That's pretty impressive. And the rate at which you, both of you and teachers in general are pivoting to connect with students, right? First and foremost, it's communication. That's what I hear you talking about, right? Just to make right. that connection and keep that relationship alive right. with the kids. And that's a, a very fast pivot and fa fantastic. Right. So um, other tools so I, that you're using to connect or any texting or FaceTiming or can, how are you connecting with your colleagues? Well, I noticed we're using Slack suddenly. It's something I didn't have much experience with before, um, but it's been something we've been using to kind of have a way of connecting, you know, on a personal level and on projects. So it's been pretty interesting. It's new. Mm -hmm. We're just doing a lot of texting. We have group texts going around. We have um, reply emails. So we're just um, trying to use the resources we have. We're a pretty small district, four schools, 3,000 students. So we're just um, four principals. We just all stay connected through texting. There's an app called Voxer, V-O-X-E-R. Oh, yeah. right? You may already be using it, but it's so wonderful for that asynchronous learning and sharing. Mm -hmm. And especially right now when everything we're doing is brand new. My mic again. And hey, everybody. This hey. meeting is hey. being recorded. Hey. Hey. Hi there. That was so hey. cool. So did we that just... That was awesome. How was I didn't that? know you could do that with Zoom. I had no idea. So hey, cool. Everybody. cool. Was that cool or what? That was it cool, was. right? It Very was. cool. <laughs> okay. So I tell me, um, Omar, here, Omar tell me, Omar, who was in your group with you? So I had the honor of having Pam and Susan in my group, and uh, we had a chance to really have a good conversation about some tools that we're using. Which tools did you come up with? Well, you know, it's interesting. In the beginning, we really just focused on the tools for engaging the students. I shared that while Zoom is really something that we're using a lot with colleagues, most of my students aren't familiar with it, and we're finding we have to use things like Google Hangout. Susan shared that she recently began using Google Meet with her students, and we began just kind of looking at ways we can use that. One thing we're doing is we're both using S'more as a newsletter vehicle. I know recently another tool that we had to use because of the purchase order timeline crunch because of the crisis, um, we ended up using easytexting.com. There we were able to grab a bunch of emails and send out blast emails to students to be able to um, you know, go ahead and um, include a link to the S'more. However, like I was sharing with the PO Crunch timeline, we realized we weren't going to be able to get that out. So what we did was we created a Google Voice account just for the program, the California Career Innovations Google Voice. And then I was able to send out up to 10 messages at a time. So you can copy those 10 phone numbers and send them out. It was six messages for my 60 students, and it really worked out great. So I just think that that's that was more than we used. And then in, in closing, um, um, Pam really um, reminded us about another tool that we had uh, talked about, and that was Boxer, that it was also a great tool to be utilizing. And she reminded me that, hey, we are using the tool at the county office. We're now using Slack, which I'm very new to, but it seems to be cool. We're using it to both connect on a personal level, you know, sending pictures of our workspaces, as well as having a project group so we can, you know, work on projects. Mm. That is so excellent. And in honor of your of your time, what I want to do, because I do want to have a collective wealth uh, of this knowledge here, in the chat, would you guys take the time, please, to jot down either the tools you said or the ones that most uh, resonated with you, like, oh, this is something I got to try, I, I want to think about this. Go ahead and just write those key na the names of the things that you um, just were talking about with, in your small group. Um, if we had more time, I would really go through this just one by one by each group because it's a wealth of knowledge that we have here, right? Everybody has tried something and sometimes failed at some things and said, well, I tried this and I'll never do that one again or whatever. But just listening to each other is really powerful. So creating that kind of a, maybe a discussion board together where you could actually have that exchange. In our course in, in, in the Canvas program, we use something called Yellow Dig, which is kind of a social media um, structure that's a plug-in to Canvas, but we say leave academic is academic, and this is for the social stuff or anything else you want to share. 
If you guys had a yellow dig account, you could begin doing that. It's kind of like a, a, a more fancy Facebook thing that you can actually have tags. So things get sorted differently. So you might think about organizing this information in that way. That's a really wonderful, thank you. So what I wanted to do is to think of, I'm gonna anticipate some of the things that you guys said. And can you see my screen, Cynthia, is this okay? Yeah, okay. I just wanna talk about um, some of the most boring handful of old tools you already know. And I wanna give it a twist. I wanna show you how you might use them differently. So for example, we know that things like having these large group sessions, like the ones we just had right now, the ones that we're having in Zoom, um, they serve a purpose. They serve an interesting purpose. But one thing that you might not know is that they have two different powerful things that happen related to um, neuroscience of learning. One is that when you're online in this context, virtually, there is what's called a disinhibition effect. So Katie, some things that you might not say out loud to somebody face to face, you actually have no problem doing it online. There's this kind of a protection, this magic and anonymity shield that goes up. So you're able to share some things that you might not have the courage to do when you're sitting face to face, which is really interesting. There's also this idea of um, social contagion that I've mentioned many times before. We know that any person can lead social contagion. Anybody, Melissa, can decide the mood. This is what we talk about uh, learning environments, right? You have a learning environment. You walk in and you've observed classrooms and you see like, oh my gosh, what happened here? Who died, right? You have a terrible environment or you have environments where you say, everybody's just electric. They're engaged, they're focused, you know, that's wonderful. Oh, I hear an echo. Can you guys all mute yourselves if you're not talking because I'm hearing a, an echo here. I'm gonna, yeah, thank you. Okay, so we know that, um, Social contagion exists in face-to-face -face and it also exists in online um, in, in, in the same kind of intensity. And some argue, Mayer argues even more because you wanna know something really cool, Stephen. Right now, we can all see each other's faces. And what is so crazy about this is that if you're in a regular classroom, half the time you're looking at somebody's back of their head. But right now, we're looking at all of each other's faces. That intensifies the transmission of social contagion. Um, I can also call everybody by name, right, Katie? And because we can all see each other's names, we can personalize that experience a little bit better, right? The other thing that's really kind of creepy cool, and I, it's really hard to think about it, I had to have a student remind me of this uh, last week, you see yourself, and that changes your body language, that changes how you interact, that changes the way you decide to do things. So um, we know that we can leverage these kind of group encounters differently online. We also know that in the small breakout room we just had, right? This allows individual voices. We can hear everybody. You can personalize this experience much more and it's much more authentic to participants to be able to, to be a part of this rather than just sort of observe from the outside, right? In the chat that we had, we're using this, the chat actually gets recorded um, and it gets recorded in, in the time, so it goes in parallel with the video you'll be able to see in the transcript. But this also creates another kind of a record and a documentation. But another thing it does, Ben, for, remember I said what was so important um, for learning? What were those two things that we have to have for learning? What systems have to be working well? Why did I ask you to write? Which two systems have to be working really well? Neuroscience and technology. That's what we need to add to teacher learning, absolutely. And what do we need to be able to learn? What are two systems in your brain that we need to attention, learn? Attention yes. and memory. And memory. Yes, yes. So what's so fascinating is it's absurd to have somebody give a talk and then say, oh, and leave all your questions till the end. That's crazy. Your brain can't handle that. Your brain is so, it's of two minds. It's trying to get, it's thinking about what it wants to get clarified but it's supposed to pay attention to this new thing. Have you ever seen kids in your class look totally like lost when they're trying to pay, keep up with what you're saying, but they're still thinking about what you just said? So the chat allows you to do that. In real time, you can say, wait, was Rachel really that address? Is this the one? Because you're, you cared about that. You wanted to clarify it and you can do it immediately. And if you have somebody like I have the, the honor of working with Cynthia, somebody who's so good on the chat board, she's able to make sure that everybody's attention can stay where it needs to be because she satisfies that a need for immediacy to have something resolved, right? 
We also know that we can use quizzes in online structures in a different way. I use them. Um, I, my students can take my quizzes a thousand times. I don't care. They just have to get a perfect grade eventually because what I want to use this so that they have frequent low stake testing is shown to enhance memory systems and therefore learning. So if you give multiple, you say, just take this, make sure that you get 100 before you come to class. I don't care how many times you take it, but I want them to know the vocabulary and the conceptual knowledge so that I can use that as my platform for the, the in-class talk, right? You can also use things like the discussion boards to create community. We talk about this idea that um, learning is social. One plus one is three. My dad was a, a public school math teacher. If I got to tell you guys that. Uh, one plus one is three. You know, Susan has a great idea and Lisa has a great idea. But the minute they talk about it, they have something better than either one of them could have done by themselves. And so the discussion boards, we use them not so somebody says, oh, post a reply to this question. No, the way we use it, Jennifer, is we say, here's a prompt. Write a response and resp reply to at least two other learners. And then we start to see these engaging dialogues happen and people start to have an understanding of each other a lot better. So you can create community through the discussion boards. You can also use what we call mini libraries. These are called bundles, which are very, um, very select and curated um, up-to-date resources that are free and open source support systems like certain, they can be videos, they can be articles or books, or they can be apps that you can give your students to support them in that particular topic. So we create this in order to do what? It's so cool. It allows us to differentiate their homework. You've heard of this, it's how important it is to differentiate. This allows you to differentiate the homework. You say, choose anything in the bundle, at least one thing, in addition to watching the pre-class flipped video, okay, and then come to class. Then they have this wealth of information. So there's a way to integrate these things into your in online classes. For anybody who wants, um, my class at Harvard is in, in Canvas and I'm, I'm happy to give a, a tour to any of you. And within the PowerPoint, you'll see there's hyperlinks where there's actually a video tour of our classroom, which we wrote out to a bunch of colleagues who asked us, help, we have to go online and we don't know where to start. So one of the ways your brain learns fastest, believe it or not, Stephen, is when you have a worked model. If I can show you, well, if your essay looks something like this, or if your problem solution looks something like that, you'll be successful. So seeing a worked model really lowers the anxiety. So if you wanna have a tour of a classroom that's set up, go ahead and look at that, you know, that might help you. And then we also have a tour for students to help them feel comfortable. So this is telling the students how to get in the classroom, what it looks like so that they feel better. So in summary, um, online to me is, it saves me time and it really helps me reach and know my students much better. I am able to really differentiate. I know what they need and I can give them what they need because of something called universal design for learning. So I've created the resources and the bundles that allow me to have multiple entry points to the information so I can differentiate and it's much more personal. And I know that sounds so ironic, but those are the kinds of comments we get from our students at the end of the year. They say, oh, I never knew online could be intimate, you know, and it's a really fun thing to hear because there's potential here. And instead of like lamenting that we've got this change, we should really be celebrating this. So I wanna ask, um, and uh, Terry, who is this? Was it Terry that I said had that beautiful radio voice? Mm -hmm. Who was it that I said at the beginning? Was it Terry? Yes, it was me. I think it was. So I want you to read this for me because I want you guys to, we've talked about technology, we're talking about the brains, but the whole conversation is about kids. So I want you to read this please for us. I have come to a frightening conclusion. I am the decisive element in the classroom. It is my personal approach that creates the climate. It is my daily mood that makes the weather. As a teacher, I possess a tremendous power to make a child miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor, hurt or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a situation be escalated or de-escalated and a child humanized or dehumanized. You're better than I thought. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. It's just to remind us, and when we talk about social contagion, our attitude is gonna count for about more than 50% of this being, is this working or not? If we walk in traumatized and hating this and anxious and worried, it's gonna spill over. If we walk in saying, what an amazing opportunity we have, 
it's going to change everything. So I really, really want to encourage you to think about that and to make sure that you're caring or embodying that right attitude um, so that your social contagion is what we want it to be. So I just want to steal from you two more minutes to do a three, two, one. I'd like you to go back to the notes you had and I'd like you to think for a second because something else we do not do enough, Renee, in education is give time for reflection. It's so important to have downtime to actually think, did I learn anything? Was this important or not? So I'm gonna give you two minutes in complete silence. Can you please try to write these out? Three things you didn't know before, two things that are interesting or curious about, and one thing you may change. Okay, in honor of your time, and I am I do apologize, we went over a teeny bit. Um, we're going to stop. And for those of you who I know have very busy schedules and need to go and do things, feel free. Um, we are not going to hold you hostage because we know that we, we offered you a specific time and we do want to honor that. But if you do have questions or want to stick around, we're, we're going to stick around here. And I do want to answer some of the things I saw in the chat really quickly. Um, after that. But uh, again, if you have not uh, written down the learningsciences.com, please explore the resources there. And they are free and open source, and, and we hope that you can use those. So thank you so much for leading us through this learning journey this evening. It's particularly critical right now where we as a global community are transitioning to online and remote learning at warp speed. These conversations, these skill developments, and then understanding that really the brain is benefiting from this and perhaps this is one of the blessings in disguise as a result of this pandemic. Well, thank you for the wonderful opportunity for an uh, excellent group of people. You can ask for a better group to try to do something that is so different and sort of a big paradigm shift in the way we approach education. Um, really excellent uh, group. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay. Our pleasure and let's have a wonderful evening and we'll talk soon. Talk soon. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.